Welcome to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. I hope you're having a great day as we continue to celebrate all the people who are working so hard across the state of Mississippi to make this such a great place to live, work, and play. Before we get to our guest today, I want to share something that popped up in my sort of electronic history book of all the reading that I do every morning. One is this electronic history book telling about the, uh, the, the key moments in history that date back from the date, whatever the date is that I'm reading it. And uh, two that really stuck out. One, actually, the o Oklahoma City bombing killed 168 people back in 1995. It's hard to believe it's been that long ago. I can remember so much about that uh, when that happened. Um, another one about Charles uh, Darwin. He died back in 1882. Pretty pretty amazing, the, the contributions that, that Charles Darwin made to uh, you know Earth <laughs> with with all of his contributions, but he said once he said a man who dares waste one hour of time has not discovered the value of life. You know, one of the th I pointed out this I, I saw this this uh, video not long ago. This guy had this really long rope. I, I may have mentioned it on on the show. It may have been fifty feet long, and on the very end there was this little red tape. And on the very very end. And he said, okay, so this rope represents the known uh, human history. And this red tape at the very tip is the time that you're there. <laughs> so it helps you sort of appreciate that we're here for a very, very short period of time. And what Darwin is trying to reflect about is anyone who wastes even one hour, given the short time that we're here, doesn't really understand the value of life. So... You know, are you one that's not going to leave anything on the table, or are you kind of wasting away some of your time? Just something to contemplate as we uh, as we think about that. And one other, uh, be brave and clear. Follow your heart, and don't uh, don't be overly influenced by outside factors. Be true to yourself. Shirley Temple Black said that. I, I, I can, you know, maybe I'm dating myself, but I can remember as a child watching Shirley Temple movies. Uh, I'll just never forget that. Be brave and clear. Follow your heart. And don't be overly influenced by outside factors. Be true to yourself. That, I'll try, I try to live by that. I try not to be too influenced by outside factors, especially when I get onto something that's important to the community. And there go, are going to be people who want to kind of silence your voice. I love being independent. I'm in a position in my life today where independent serves me really well, having this show and then Super Talk Outdoors. Okay, with all that said, now let's shift gears and move over to someone I enjoy ca uh, catching up with from Mississippi Power, Jeff Shepard. And uh, before we go any further, let me just say welcome back to the show, Jeff. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, I didn't realize you were going to get so deep this morning on the introduction. But, uh, yeah, that, that Darwin stuff gives you something to think about, doesn't it? You know, it really does. I mean, we're really here for such a short period of time. We've uh, listen, because uh, because I had had two just deep conversations with George Logel, uh, one just a few weeks before he passed away. Um, I've had I've done a lot of reflecting, and George said something really powerful to me that I've shared on the show many times. But if you didn't hear it, I'll, I'll say it again. I asked him about legacy. I said, you know, how do you want to be remembered, George? And he said he didn't want to be remembered. He said, what I want is for the things that I was involved with to continue. And whether my name is attached to them or not, if they had some role in keeping people here from, you know, keeping them from having to move away or bringing people back here who had to, to move away to pursue their career, that's all I want. That's all I want. And I don't really care whether my name is attached to it or not. But you, know, you think about legacy in the short period of time that we're here on this earth. It's, um, you know, I think more if more people and I think the good thing about living in Mississippi, because I think we're very resilient and the, the natural disasters that we face, we know what it feels like to reach out to your neighbor and help each other and whatever. But I think people realize that there's a role for them to play. Um, there, are, there are gaps to fill in the community. There are nonprofits to be involved in. And I think that's one of the great benefits of living here. But, you know, I, I wish more people would realize that because we can never have too many people involved in nonprofit affairs of our community. So, yeah, I, it just helps you think about, you know, the, the short time we're here. You know, what do we want people to say of us when we're when we're dead and gone? You know, no, that's right. And, you know, we talk about here at the, at the power company, you know, the circle of concern and the circle of influence, you know, um, like not having those exterior factors. You know, if you can't do anything about it, well, why are you going to let it eat at you? But if you have the ability 
you know, to uh, influence a decision or relationship, you know, for the betterment of folks across Southeast Mississippi, where we, you know, where we serve. That's that's what we want to do. That's what we want to do here at, at a power company. Yeah. Hey, listen, I worked for Mississippi Power back in 1978, 1979, and 1980. And, right. and we've talked about that before in purchasing right. yeah. and while I was going to school. And it was a great, great time for me. And I remember if I was working there when Hurricane Frederick hit uh, coastal Mississippi and, you know, got to see this, what an emergency plan for Mississippi Power looks like. I know that was back then, but even back then, super serious, <laughs> you know, super planned. Everybody had a role to play. And that was uh, that was a that was a lot of there was a lot of good that came from that. But one of the things I remember back then, and it's even more so true today, if you guys were to ever plot every single employee of Mississippi Power Company and what they're involved in in the community in so many different ways, I mean, it could be a volunteer, it could be leading something, it can be leading a regional organization, it could be, it's so many different ways. It could be given to United Way. I don't you you name it. That plot would be super complex, what, what, wouldn't it be? It would be the majority of the company would be my best guess. You know, we give or take about a thousand employees currently at the company across, you know, our 23 county service territory. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, Ricky, we encourage and identify, you know, certain employees to be on, on boards or involved in the community. And look, sometimes it doesn't even have to be. Um, you know, community, uh, company driven, like, you know, a, a United Way board or a chamber board or something like that. But more times than not, even if you're just involved in the local, you know, T-ball league, because one of your children's playing on that, you kind of almost just are expected to assume a position of leadership um, yeah. and, and be heavily involved. And that's something that we focus, um, you know, we really focus on when it comes to the communities that we serve. Well, I'm I'm confident of it. I, I am, and, and you know, Anthony Wilson, the, the your 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 boss and my friend, who's the current president of Mississippi Power Company. We've talked in great detail about this, but to have a to have a president who is from the local area, who really understands this community, that gets it, um, that's been a terrific benefit to Mississippi Power Company, hasn't it? No, it really has. Um, so I am in my. 13th year at, at the company now and the the presidents that had worked uh, here before I, you know i got along great with them i mean i was in my role as a spokesperson at the company you know you kind of have a direct interaction with them but you, i think he said it really well i mean to have someone who knows the difference between you know the point and back bay you know and and there is a difference believe me you know? <laughs> and and if you don't think that and then ask somebody from that part of the of Biloxi, you know, but, but to have someone, you know, uh, had, who, you know, was from Mississippi, grew up down here, went to Mississippi state, uh, started at Mississippi power working on Oak street, you know, in, in Biloxi, um, it, you know, it, he just has an intimate knowledge, um, you know, of the way folks live down here, the things that are important to people in South Mississippi. And then he spent six years working in Marid in that division as well. And so he understands, you know, central Mississippi a little different sometimes than it is here on the coast. And so, but he, but he gets all of that. So he really looks at, you know, our company, our employees as, you know, we are serving everyone that is in the 23 Southeast Mississippi counties. But beyond that, we represent the state of Mississippi as well. Yeah. So it's so interesting that you brought up the um, point versus back bay or Wool market area, whatever you know, everybody has their views of that, but it's really important. And he, of course, he was raised in those areas, so you know he yeah. knows it well. Um, I married a girl from the Point, a Bahanovich, so you know I, I came to understand it really well. In fact, it's funny though, me being from Gulfport, years after I we moved to Biloxi, and I would you know I would fish in tournaments, and they would say Ricky Matthews from Gulfport, and like <laughs> four or five years after Ann and I had moved to Biloxi, they would still say Ricky Matthews from Gulfport. Uh -huh. And one day she says, Bubba, don't you think it's time for them to say for, from Biloxi? <laughs> so, <laughs> but all these little nuances. Once I was talking with uh, Chevis Wetman uh, yeah. from People's Bank, so, such mm -hmm. a terrific leader over so many years. And Chevis said, you know, used to you go to DeBee's Road and you know, there's this big wall and you get on the Biloxi side and you see the big wall and you get on the Gulfport side and you see the big wall and the way he talked about the wall. 
And, uh, you know, over the years, we've really done a good job of sort of obliterating the wall, you know, thinking yeah. regionally, you know, coming together on the common issues, one coast, so to speak. Right. I think we've done a good job with that. Well, and that's so important. I mean, I mean, it really is because, you know, not to be so cliche, but rising tides do lift all boats. And if someone wants to locate a facility or a factory or something in Biloxi, people in Gulfport and people in Ocean Springs and people in Wiggins are going to benefit from it. And you know, we have to we have to continue thinking like that. I mean, it's really yeah. critical. And, you know, that's definitely the view that we take at the power company is, is, you know, it's just if we can get get these companies into Mississippi and then get them into southeast Mississippi, we're going to charm them and we're going to show them why this is such a great place to live, work and play. I mean, it's just what we do. I am so confident of that. And uh, listen, uh, when we come back with Jeff, we're going to we're going to go take a break real quick. And when we come back. We're going to talk about what's going on at Mississippi Power these days. There's a there's a really important project that's underway now about you know uh, creating more resiliency in the power infrastructure, and we'll talk a little bit about that and whatever else he wants to talk about. Really busy tropical season coming. Right. I'm sure the folks at the power company aren't excited to see some of those um, prognostications. But when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Jeff Shepard. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. We have uh, Jeff Shepard. Uh, I enjoy visiting with Jeff, uh, with, with Jeff because as a uh, spokesman for Mississippi Power Company, he's he gets to travel around a bit and gets to understand the important role that Mississippi, Mississippi Power plays in the southern portion of Mississippi, multiple uh, communities, about 190,000 customers or something like that. What's the, what's the latest number? Uh, we are uh, a little bit more than that now. We're getting close to 192,000. Yeah, uh, yeah. Across 23 counties and 54 municipalities, I believe, is the, yeah. the number. So. Yeah, I still think I still think one of the one of the most profound stories ever in the history of power companies in the U.S. will be how quickly Mississippi Power was able to get anyone who could receive power after Hurricane Katrina back up as quickly as you guys did. You know, I, I love, I, and one of the, when I was working with Haley Barber, Governor Haley Barber on the, um, the Governor's Commission, one of the one of the uh, photos that he liked to show in some of the speeches that he gave was a satellite view of Mississippi the day after Hurricane Katrina, where there were virtually no lights on in the entire state. So, you know, people think of it as a coast storm, and as it related to the impact of the surge, that was for sure. But uh, the the infrastructure damage all throughout the state of Mississippi was very, very significant. And what you guys have been really focused on since then is re building resiliency back into the system. I think Hurricane Zeta was a, was a good test. Z Zeta, Zeta was a butt kicker. And, yeah, well, <laughs> but you guys really stood that test really well, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Uh, you know, that was one that came through in the middle of the night in in late October, if you remember, late October of 2020. It was right before the election. And so, you know, we understood the importance. One of That was one of the things of, you know, voting precincts and, you know, all those different things. But, uh, you, you know, Ricky, we had about half of our customers receive some damage. We actually received a lot of damage um, on our transmission system. The storm, very similar to Katrina, kind of came in on the western side of the coast um, over in that, you know, Bay St. Louis, you know, Waveland type area, and then came up into our service territory that way and damaged some uh, transmission uh, infrastructure. And just, you know, those are not um, as easily accessible as the power poles are on the end of your street, you know, so it just takes more time, more coordination. All of that is built into our plan. But it does take some time, you know, to marshal all of those resources and get them where they need to be and then to go and do those work. Those structures are usually bigger. Those lines are more powerful. So it just takes a little bit more time. But, yeah, um, you know, we had everybody back up, I want to say, within maybe three or three days or so, I, I believe, was the number. And so, again, you're talking about, you know, ni around 90,000 people impacted at that time, you know, that we're yeah. able to get back on. Well, it was just such an interesting storm because of the angle that it came in yeah. at. It came in and then it went, at, you know like toward Atlanta, just, just right across the uh, mm -hmm. coast of Mississippi, storm uh, I being north of Harrison County. But what was it was interesting at my house, I remember so well those 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 winds coming across, like I, I want to say coming from the at least initially coming from the east to the west. 
and just nonstop. Where usually with these storms, you have you know lots of wind and you know the heavy rains pushing those winds from the atmosphere down down, and you're, you get these big gusts, and then it settles down a little bit, and then another wave comes. But not with Zeta; it was like this constant, steady. And I thought, wow, this is going to be really interesting to the power company. Well, you know, and, and Zeta was really the storm, Ricky, that kind of um, really brought to light some of the things we had been seeing in the utility industry from a storm restoration perspective um, with regards to, you know, how much time you get to get the lights back on. You know, think about it. You mentioned Katrina. 12 days, uh 12,000 workers came in from all over the place to get the, you know, the power on, you know, for our customers. We, we don't have 12 days now. 12 days would just be, you know, people would be up in arms. Um, in, in yeah. 12 days Because that's just how fast the world moves now when it comes to yeah. social media and some other things. Yeah. So that is built into our plan, the time of the response. You know, we understand the importance. One of the main things that we look to do is ahead of the storm have resources in place, you know, we're, you know, you pretty confident where the storm's going to come. I know, you know, Katrina made that last minute move and, and came, but, you know, most of the time you're, you're pretty sure, okay, we can stage folks in Louisiana or we can stage folks in Arkansas and they can be here the next day, or they can be maybe in Mobile and they can be here the next day, depending on, you know, which angle is coming up. That saves so much time post-storm, having the resources marshaled and in place to, to be able to respond the next day. That, that's definitely lessons learned there. Yeah, when you think about the way the, the power companies up the East Coast and into Florida and then across yeah. the Gulf of Mexico, the way that these power companies coordinate their efforts is just, it's, it's just a hell of a story. It's a hell of a so, story. Yeah, it's yeah. called the Mutual Assistance Program, Ricky, and it's a, it's a call that, you know, member utilities of the Southeastern Electric <laughs> Exchange, which we're a member of, they have calls. If something's out in the Gulf, you know, when we say we're monitoring these things, that I mean, we are. And all the utilities are. Okay, it's going to Mississippi. Georgia can release resources. North Carolina can release resources and have them in position coming down this way. Oh, no, it's, you know, it's going to go to Georgia. Okay, well, Mississippi can send 100-something folks. And, and Alabama can maybe send some people as well. It, it is all very coordinated. Everybody understands your time is coming. Um, whether it's tornadoes in the Midwest, hurricanes down here, snowstorms in the Northeast. We go to Dallas every three years for an ice storm. You know, I mean, it's just, it's constant, but everybody understands the importance of getting those lights back on. So we've inv you've invested in t new technologies and all kinds of things. In the short time we have left, you're also taking old crystal poles and replacing them with, with more resilient materials. Yeah, so there's, you know, um, big projects kicking off in South Mississippi over the next couple of weeks. Um, we're going to be replacing about 250 wooden poles with concrete and steel. Uh, it'll be some transmission lines, if you're familiar with where MGCCC is in Harrison County, right off the Bees Road uh, in Switzer. We're going to re be replacing some uh, poles there with from uh, wood to steel, and that'll go over into Biloxi. And then by Pass Road Elementary in Gulfport, we're going to start on the distribution poles. Those are the poles that most people see in their neighborhoods. And those are going to go from wood to concrete. Look, Ricky, I don't think this is shocking news, but post-storm in the restoration effort, the most time-consuming job is setting new poles. Um, it takes anywhere from three to four, maybe five hours to you know, get the equipment off of a pole, get it out of the ground, put the new one in, put the equipment back on, hang the wire, do the switching, get it all connected. And so a great example is what happened in Moss Point last summer. You know, we had 75 poles that had to be replaced in the city. About 20 of them were right down Main Street in downtown Moss Point. But you can't get the lights back on until every one of them set and every wire's hung and all the equipment's back up there. And so that's 20 poles times four hours. I mean, that's eight, that's an 80 hours of, of work just right there to get Main Street back up in Moss Point. So putting these more resilient, stronger poles in there is all part of you know what we call storm hardening our system, building up that resiliency, making it a stronger system. So when the next storm comes, there's less damage, there's less time waiting to get the lights back on for our customers. Don't you wish everything could be underground? <laughs> well, uh, it could be, um, but the way that works is there's a cost associated with it, you know. Yeah. And it, it, because look, yes, it does. Um, 
you know, it does uh, reduce the time that there are outages. But I have lived in a neighborhood before when there when there was underground service and when, you know, you do have to come out, you have you're digging into people's yards. There's you know, there's concrete, there's pipes underground. I mean, it's not just as simple as everybody, you know, wants to make it out to seem. So there are, you know, some inherent costs that are you know born there as well. Well, after Katrina, I spent a tremendous amount of time with, with Anthony DePazzi, the former yeah. president of Mississippi Power. And I have to tell you, whether it was at public meetings or wherever, the number one question he always got was that. And well, I mean, and, and, yeah. Well, and Ricky, you know, there were, there were some, some of the cities, you know, took advantage of some of the federal dollars that were available and did that. You know, they, they had the foresight, at, you know, to go ahead and, and, Put some of the lines underground, um, but again, you know, not everybody could do it. No, I, you're right, and I, I don't even remember the number, but I, I just remember the number being big. It was a really big number because he eventually just developed the number that he shared, and it was just completely out of sight. When you consider the cost of having to bury power, right, with the need to rebuild infrastructure in general, and the you know the tens of billions of dollars that yeah. that the Federal government it's, was sending down the coast of Mississippi. Yeah, bearing, thousands. Bearing right. power lines was not in the cards. <laughs> yeah, it's thousands and thousands of miles just on our distribution system alone, much less across the entire state. And look, Ricky, I, I do want to mention one other thing about these these projects down here. You know, we're we're starting these projects in Gulfport. We're going to continue moving, you know, across southeast Mississippi and replacing poles all over the place. I would just urge folks, if you're driving around, just use caution. We're going to have safety specialists on the site, you know, flagging traffic. But there's going to be some heavy lifting that's going to be done with cranes and, and you know, big concrete poles, as you might imagine. So, you know, just keep that in mind if you're driving in these areas. We'll do that. And listen, as we get closer to the start of hurricane season, again, all the experts are saying we're going to be busy, sadly. Yeah. Uh, we'll have you back on and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the approaching hurricane season. Jeff, it's been a pleasure to catch up with you, my friend. Appreciate it, Ricky. Thank you very much. You bet. This has been Jeff Sheffer from Mississippi Power Company. Uh, when we come back, we'll continue the conversation. We'll see you after this.